and welcome to Misconceptions, a program that is dedicated to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Romul Gassain, and today we have with us Dr. Mark Harwood from Creation Ministries International, who will be discussing with us the biblical account of Noah's Ark. First of all, welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, Rommel. It's great to be here. Thank you for coming on board and giving us your time. Now, as we've been going through these episodes, we've been able to discuss many things, specifically evidences with the world that we live in, which focus or point to the historicity of the Bible. Yes. Now, often when we do discuss biblical accounts, there's one story that people sometimes quirk about or laugh about, and that is the story of Noah's Ark. A lot of people tend to believe that it's a myth or it's just a, a child's story. Yes, indeed, people do, and they think it's uh, quite a fantastic story, probably because it seems so unlike anything that we encounter today. Yes. But the Bible gives us an historical record of the things which actually took place right at the very beginning. And in the opening chapters of this book, we have God's eyewitness account in a very sober uh, historical uh, record of things which we can have confidence really did occur. Now the Bible actually in the book of Genesis devotes three whole chapters to this dramatic and cataclysmic event called Noah's flood, chapters 6, 7 and 8. Now when the Bible devotes that much time we really need to pay attention because I believe that in fact it's recording something which really did happen. Interestingly, Jesus himself believed that Noah's Ark was a real event and, uh, because he referred to Noah. Uh, and, uh, he said in um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, he said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So he likened his second coming to what the circumstances were like in Noah's day. So if Noah and the flood and the ark were just a myth, then how can we be sure that Jesus will indeed return just like he said? That's right, and that's quite important because we're able to see that in the same time in Noah's day that people were happy and laughing and you know eating and so on, and they were sort of really weren't concerned about eternity. That's Christ right. used that as an illustration an example that people that lived in his day, they were careless about eternal things. That's right, and in fact the Bible says that they were marrying and giving in marriage right up to the day that the flood came and took them all away. Yes. So it was, uh, but the Bible also says they were very evil days and uh, great evil had spread out over the face of the earth, which was why God resolved to bring judgment onto the face of the earth. Yes. But one of the reasons people think that the ark is just a children's story is because they have this image or this concept of a kind of leaky old bathtub sort of thing with a couple of giraffes neck sticking out the top, you know. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm sure you've all seen pictures like that. But the Bible actually gives us the dimensions of the ark itself. And uh, in this illustration, we show a little bit of what it might have been like. It was at least 140 metres long. And you can see there we've got a picture of a semi-trailer to give you some dimension, some feel for the scale of it. It was a very large vessel, estimated to have a carrying capacity of some 15,000 tonnes. Wow. Now that's now, a large boat. Very mm -hmm. large. I mean, a vessel that large, you would then tend to think to yourself, well, what was it that prevented it from toppling over or from flipping over? Especially we know that the story of Noah's Ark, when the flood did occur, there was a lot of wind, a lot of rain, a lot of waves and so yes, on. Yes, that's right. It was in fact a, a cataclysmic event. And, uh, but it's interesting when you look at those dimensions, the, the Ark's dimensions in the book of Genesis, um, people who, uh, who study these things, naval architects, have determined that it actually had optimal stability for rough seas. And uh, other creationists believe that perhaps there was some mechanism that would have been designed to cause the arc to point into the wind. Therefore, um, it would be pointing directly into the oncoming waves. So all of those things uh, would have maximised its stability. But I think the important thing to bear in mind is that the beginning of Genesis chapter 8, it says, God remembered Noah. Yes. So there is no doubt that his divine hand was there uh, ensuring that Noah and his family and all the animals on, on board the ark survived. So tell us also, how did all the animals fit in the ark? 
Well, they, you might well ask that, and it's a very common question because, you know, we think of all the different animals that we have today and we think, how on earth could they have all fitted into a boat? But the Bible says that God brought two of every kind of animal, seven of some, to Noah, and they went on board the ark. So the question is, what is a kind? Now, when we look around the world today, we see a wide variety, for instance, of dogs. But Noah didn't have to have on board the ark two terriers, two Great Danes, two poodles, two chihuahuas, you know, all the, the variety of dogs. He just needed two of dog kind, probably wolf-like animals, in fact. Now, it's been estimated that there have been, since the time of creation, something like 8,000 different kinds of animals. So Noah would have had approximately 16,000 animals on board the ark. And the average size of those would have been much less than, say, that of a sheep. Now, the vessel that we showed you earlier of those dimensions today can carry in excess of 120,000 sheep. Wow. So it was clearly big enough for the task to house Noah, his wife, their three sons and their wives, two of every kind of animal and all the supplies that they needed that they while needed. they were on board. Yes. Another question would be also, how long did they remain on the ark for? Well, the Bible gives a very clear timeline of how long they were on board the ark. It says that the floodgates of the heavens were opened. Uh, it says the fountains of the great deep burst forth. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but it says that the waters rose on the surface of the earth for 150 days. And then it tells us that the ark ran aground um, on the, uh, around the uh, region of Mount Ararat. And then God sent a drying wind and the waters began to subside. And uh, the Bible tells us that it was seven months later that they came off the ark. So if you add up all the times which are given there in the scriptures, they were actually on board the ark for more than a year. Wow. So it was a very substantial amount of time. Yes, and that also adds to the fact that had this thing only you know, lasted for a, a few days, then you couldn't turn around and say that the judgment fell upon every single creature. But because this was for 40 days and 40 nights, it rained, but they did not run aground for at least five months, months that's right. we find that's right. out. It really shows how devastating this was to the earth. Indeed, and, and the whole account in the Bible is very plausible. Um, there are other accounts in uh, different cultures of flood stories and things, one of which is a Babylonian account called the Gilgamesh Epic, and that has the flood lasting for just seven days. So that's you know, unlikely to wreak global uh, devastation in the same sort of measure that we read about in the book of Genesis. So when the animals got off the ark, they were in a localised place, but then how did they distribute themselves to other continents and other places? Yes, very good question, because we find some really quite fascinating distributions of animals, don't we, around the world today? Yes. Well, you might recall in a previous episode, we talked about immediately following the flood that there would have been an ice age. Now, the ice age would have had the effect of lowering the ocean levels around the world. And there are some key places in the world, particularly what we now call the Bering Straits, which are between Russia and Alaska, and also down through the Indonesian archipelago down towards Australia, where if you lowered the ocean levels, you would form land bridges. So this event, remember, takes place immediately after the flood, and about a century later we have the events of the Tower of Babel. So those land bridges would have provided a pathway for the animals to migrate as they spread out away from uh, where they came off the ark, and of course for people uh, away from the Tower of Babel. Now as the Ice Age went on and on over some five to seven centuries, slowly the uh, ocean levels rose again and the, the temperature equilibrium was restored around the earth, pretty much like it is today. And as the oceans rose, they, that would have cut off those land bridges, isolating various populations of animals. So some people say, well, why did the kangaroos end up in Australia and not in America? Um, well, frankly, we don't know, but they did because that's what we observe has happened. So as the animals started to spread away around from, uh, from the ark, remember it wasn't just two kangaroos that hopped all the way all by themselves. It would have taken possibly centuries as those populations slowly spread and started to diversify. There would have been a lot of um, 
competition for the limited food resources available immediately after the flood. Different animal groups would have gone in different directions. There would have been some predation happening. Uh, many of the animal species actually became extinct in the years following the flood and we're still finding that of course happening today. So we end up with some population of, uh, of marsupials ending up in Australia. By the way, we find marsupial fossil remains um, in Indonesia in Southeast Asia, which gives some support to the idea that that was the migratory path that they used to get to this country. And then in isolation, of course, they adapt to the changing environment and we have a wide variety of different kangaroos and wallabies and the like. So we have a model of uh, understanding the distribution of the animals based on what the Bible says, that they all came from that one place, and then what we can observe in the world around us today. That's right. Another question that someone might perhaps ask is this, was this a global flood or was it just simply a localised flood? I mean, if this was only a local flood, then it would only affect one part of the earth and not the entire planet that we live on. That's right, that's right. And a lot of people try and argue that uh, the flood must have just been local because they say there's no evidence for a global catastrophic flood. Well, nothing's ever happened like this ever before. Well, that's right. And one of the reasons being, of course, that God promised that he would never, ever send a global catastrophic flood. And he gave a sign of that promise, which is the rainbow. But it's interesting. When we look at what the scriptures say, we find that, uh, for instance, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, it says, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. And in a previous episode, we talked about the volcanic eruptions that would have been occurring around the whole surface of the earth at the onset of the flood. So the word all there speaks of, um, of massive devastation taking place. And then a little later, we read that um, the water rose and increased greatly on the earth. And it says all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. So if you think about it, if you cover all of the high mountains under the entire heavens, that speaks very clearly of a global catastrophic event. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, it's kind of impossible to have all the high mountains covered with water and have a local flood. I mean, we have a rather humorous little illustration of here of what that might look like. And as you can see, it's impossible to have a sort of sudden edge to the flood <laughs> if the high mountains were being covered. That's right. But there are some other evidences in the account which support the claim that the Bible makes that the flood was in fact global. And for instance, it tells us that um, Noah had birds on board the ark. So if it was a local flood, why did he have birds? They could have just flown to somewhere else. In fact, why even have an ark? All they had to do was migrate to a dry country. That's right. Exactly. So it really doesn't make a great deal of sense. And of course, God promised to never again send a flood like that. But how many local floods have there been? And just here in Australia recently, we experienced very serious but local flooding. So God must have broken his promise over and over again if the flood was in fact not a global event. Now, since the waters covered over the highest of mountains and it filled the entire earth, one would tend to ask, where did all the water go? Yes, a question that often comes up, Rommel. In fact, people say, look how high Mount Everest is. Are you yes. trying to tell me it covered the whole of the earth, even over the top of Everest? Well, you know, it's interesting. If you took the, uh, the land masses um, and lowered them and took the ocean basins and raised them so that the whole earth was a perfect sphere, like a, a billiard ball, then the water of the oceans would cover the earth to a depth of 2,700 metres Wow. almost three kilometres deep, a huge amount of water. In fact, the surface of the earth is about 70% covered by water. Only 30% is land. But that's still not deep enough to cover Mount Everest. But it's interesting, the Bible tells us that at the subsidence of the flood, it says the mountains rose up and the valleys sank down. The waters fled off the continents and gathered in the ocean basins where we find them today. So... It seems that what was happening at the end of the flood was there was a lot of uh, mountain building happening and we have the uh, action of tectonic plates moving together, still today raising mountain ranges. And it's interesting that uh, in the Himalayas, for instance, we find marine fossils, which tells us that once the Himalayas were actually underwater. So a reasonable conclusion we would reach is that 
Mountains like Everest, in fact, came after the flood and did not exist before uh, the flood occurred. But it's interesting, too, when you look at uh, some of the other planets in our solar system. For instance, I have here a, a picture of, uh, of the planet Mars, and you can see across the front of it there's this massive canyon like a huge scar. It's called the Valles Marineris. And it's massive. It's 5,000 kilometres long, about 7 kilometres deep, 100 kilometres wide. This is many times larger than Grand Canyon. And uh, astronomers look at this and uh, geologists and they say, oh, that must have been formed by a huge flood. It looks like it's a, a water-formed canyon. And you know, not a single drop of liquid water has ever been found on the surface of Mars. And yet they recognise the action of, uh, of a flood on the surface of Mars. Isn't it interesting when we look at the surface of the Earth, we see things like Grand Canyon and all kinds of major geological features and we say, oh, that couldn't have been caused by a flood. <laughs> and yet 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. So I think there's a very straightforward explanation for where all the water has gone. Now also, I mean, one thing that would help people to see whether this account is true or not is if they can find the remains of the ark. Has there ever been any such findings? There have been a lot of reports of findings where people claim to have uh, discovered remnants of uh, a timber structure on Mount Ararat. Yes. Um, they're very difficult though. There's always a lot of contention surrounding them and uh, I, I don't believe that any of them at this stage have really been uh, convincingly demonstrated to be the Ark. And there's always a significant risk that people could try to engage in profiteering by perhaps um, constructing some elaborate hoax to try and mislead folks into believing that they found the Ark. But, you know, my personal belief is that the evidence for the flood is far more powerful in what we see in the world around us than it is in uh, finding some bits of timber up on a mountain somewhere, because that will always be disputed. The geological evidence for a global catastrophic event like the flood is overwhelming. Yes, and also, are there any, um, any flood legends in other cultures or any other places around the world? Um, well, indeed there are. In fact, uh, it's interesting that there was a study made of um, different cultures looking at the various flood legends in those cultures. And uh, the people who did this study prepared a table. And I'd like to illustrate this because it's very significant. And in this chart, you can see here uh, across the top a list of all the different flood legends. And on the left-hand side, the key elements of the biblical account of Noah's flood. Now, the green squares on this chart show where the biblical account has been accurately reflected in the, the particular culture or the legend. The red triangles are where the thought is sort of partially uh, incorporated. But as you can see, there are many, many different cultures that have flood legends. Now, people say, but how did that come about? Well, it's interesting. We read in the Bible about a century after the flood, there was an event called the Tower of Babel. And at the Tower of Babel, God confused the languages of the people and they spread out all over the surface of the earth. So you can imagine, as these groups left Babel, they would have had an accurate memory or an account of what really did happen at the time of Noah's flood, not that long before. But over the years, as they shared the story and passed it down generation to generation, the story kind of got changed a bit, some details added, some left out and so on, it became more and more corrupted. So not surprisingly, we find these different versions, corrupted versions, of the original biblical account in many, many different cultures. Now, it's interesting that even the Aboriginal people in Australia have a flood legend. Let me read a little extract from, uh, from it for you. It says this, Then came the flood, tops of the mountains standing up above it like islands. The water kept on rising, and finally even the mountain peaks disappeared. The world was one vast, flat sheet of water, and there was no place for the Nurrumbungatias to live. Slowly, the floodwaters receded. The mountaintops appeared again, and the spearheads of trees showed above the water. The sea went back into its own place, and the land steamed under the hot sun. 
Animals, birds, insects and reptiles appeared once more and made their homes on the quickly drying plains. So isn't that fascinating? Even Australian Aborigines have a flood legend in their folklore. Now we've been able to see the story itself unfold. We're able to ask those questions that people commonly ask to try and you know, show that this, this is really just a myth, it's not real. And from what you're saying to me and what you're saying to our viewers, you can see that it's quite substantial and it's quite a valid story if you Absolutely. really assess it in terms of what has been declared or written and passed down to us. But I think a lot of people don't ask the question of why. They just look at the story, but they don't ask, why did the flood happen? Why did Noah have to build an ark? And I would like to look at the spiritual aspect of things now. And I want to ask sure. you, Mark, please tell us, what does the story of Noah's ark really tell us? The Bible tells us that great wickedness had spread out over the face of the earth, so much so that God resolved to bring judgment onto the face of the earth. The Bible says that his heart was filled with pain. Seems amazing, doesn't it? But so wicked were people. They totally rejected him. But Noah found favour and grace in God's eyes. And he and his family were the only ones who were faithful and obedient to God. And Noah, a man of great faith, constructed the ark. The Bible suggested it was about 120 years that it took him to construct the ark. Can you imagine building a, a huge vessel like that and having to withstand the ridicule of, of all the unbelieving people all around you. But then the day came just as God had said it would. Now it's interesting when we read in the New Testament, we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says this, they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, now he's referring here to people in this modern day, scoffers he says will arise, who deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. That's talking about the creation event. And then it says, by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. So here is a clear reference in the New Testament now, backing up the historical accuracy of what happened in Genesis. And then Peter goes on and says, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So the Bible is telling us that there is in fact coming a time of final judgment on this earth. And the picture that the ark gives of how Noah and his family were rescued from the judgment back then as described in Genesis, shows us that there is also a rescue plan for mankind today from the final judgment. And that rescue plan that God has put in place is through the person of Jesus himself. Because Jesus came, he paid the price for mankind's sin and he has made it possible for all of us to come back into relationship with him through faith in his only son. Mark, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure and a privilege for us. Thank you, Ronald, you're welcome. Now you've been able to listen to the account of Noah's Ark and perhaps you've been a person who's made ridicule of it. Maybe you've all thought throughout your whole life that this is just a myth, this is just a story, this is just something for little kids. But the Bible says quite to the contrary, that this is a real account, this is a real story. And in fact, we should heed this as a warning to our very own souls. God says, as Mark described to us, that God will come back again and he will hold every soul accountable for the way that they have lived their life. I really hope and pray that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ because the only way you can escape God's judgment is through him. He is not a mean saviour. He is one who invites you, one who wants you to come to him. He loves you and that was the reason why he died upon the cross. But if we reject God's offer of salvation for us, well then God will come in judgment upon the face of this earth. He will judge all men for all their deeds. So we hope that you will remember these things and that you will be challenged by them and you will actually do something about it, that you would put your trust in Jesus.
Until then, please stay in tune for the very next episode of Misconceptions and may God bless you.